started. Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, it's delightful to have uh, Yasuhiko Kimura back and I'm very, very excited about today. Uh, it's gonna be talking about the psychology and cosmology of the Ubermensch. So all the, the floor is yours, sir. Okay, so this is the seventh session in the series of presentation and discussion under the title, New Spirituality of the Future. And the theme is the psychology and the cosmology of the Ubermensch. <clears throat> More psychology today. Uh, the last session, we started with Nietzsche's pronouncement that God is dead. So today, we will resurrect God. <laughs> so from the spiritual perspective, the radical shift that took place in what Julian James calls the origin of consciousness in the breakdown of the bicameral mind was the shift of God's residence from the external to the internal. God dwells literally within you. The mistake humanity has made was to continue to believe God to be external or to deny God's existence altogether. With the first mistake, came all the organized religions of the world. With the second mistake came all the monistic materialism, which denied God or the spiritual dimension, but re still re retained the external power mentality in the metaphysics. Both have led to nihilism of which Nietzsche spoke. The crisis of consciousness will be overcome and a new kind of consciousness will arise when we completely overcome this external power mentality and belief systems so that we cease to see cars to the external, but realize that the cause is within. We cease to attribute causes to external events, circumstances, and environments. Our human chief delusion is our conviction that there are causes other than our own state of consciousness. The truth of our consciousness is that it is so powerful and causative that all that befalls us, all that is done by us, all that comes from us happens as a result of our state of consciousness. Throughout the course of history, there have been small groups of people who have actualized this possibility, this potential inherent in consciousness and who have maintained the foundation of the further evolution of human consciousness. Those are the initiates of the esoteric spiritual tra traditions. In the West, there are individual geniuses who tapped into this esoteric knowledge relatively independently from esoteric schools. William Blake was one of such examples who on their own penetrated into the esoteric realm. So I want to start with a quote from William Blake from his marriage of heaven and hell. The worship of God is honoring his gifts in other men, each according to his genius, 
and loving the greatest man the best. Those who envy or calumniate great men hate God, for there is no other God. William Blake uh, had a friendly relationship with Thomas Paine, who was 20 years senior, exactly. Who, as you know, a founding father and revolutionary philosopher, author, and activist, who was involved in both the American and French revolutions, relative to which Blake wrote several poems such as a song of liberty is about America, America, a prophecy, the French Revolution. Blake and Payne were aligned in their condemnation of institutionalized religion, but they disagreed in their evaluation of the faculty of reason, the rational faculty of the human intelligence. Thomas Paine published The Age of Reason, boldly challenging the validity of the institutionalized religion and legitimacy of the Bible as interpreted by the authorities, while arguing for the philosophical position of deism, which at that time was essentially equivalent with Spinoza's iman immanentism, which was later called pantheism. William Blake evaluated vari the poetic imagination or the poetic genius as categorically higher than reason and argued against the rationalistic philosophy of the age of reason and the enlightenment, epitomized by Isaac Newton and John Locke. He called his advocation for the poetic genius as the voice of one crying in the wilderness. He was the mi minority of one. Mm. So Thomas Paine was ahead of his time in the sense of being at the leading edge of the age of reason. William Blake was ahead of his time in the literal sense. He was the voice of the age of imagination that was to come after the age of reason and enlightenment. In several of my presentations, I have characterized the next stage of human evolution as the age of imagination. William Blake lived in his imagination in the world of the age of imagination, probably 300 years ahead of his time. At the time when the age of reason and the enlightenment was nearing and then attaining its peak, and for him, the imagination, the human imagination, the poetic genius was God. Um, another poem, actually just more like a prose, there is no natural religion, B, he says this, if it were not for the poetic or prophetic character, the philosophic and the experimental would soon be at the ratio of all things and stand still, unable to do other than repeat the same dull round over again. He who sees the infinite in all things sees God. He who sees the ratio only sees himself only. And uh, another a statement from all religion are one. He says this, the 
poetic genius is the true man and the body or outward form of man is derived from the poetic genius. Likewise, the forms of all things are derived from their genius, which by the ancient was called an angel and spirit and demon, demon in the sense of diamond, which is a Greek word for genius, which is in Latin, both of which means soul. So today we are going to explore the psychology and the cosmology of the Ubermensch. And as you know, the term the Ubermensch was first used by Nietzsche and associated with him. But here in the context of this series, I'm using the term to mean the new kind or species of the awakened and evolved human beings to come in the age of imagination. So the Ubermensch designate the spiritually awakened and the intellectually enlightened human being of the age of imagination who embodies the new kind of spirituality of the future. Elsewhere, I use the term homo deus, but since we are following the presentation of Nietzsche, we will use the Ubermensch, which actually means homo deus in the way I use it. Homo deus means divine man, as you know. <clears throat> now, Nietzsche extols Goethe as the prototype of the Ubermensch. And Goethe was, as we know, a polymatic genius, but in essence, he was a poetic genius, just as Blake was. To me, Sri Aurobindo is a poetic genius. So Goethe and Blake and Nietzsche himself therefore were a prototypical precursor, precursors of the Ubermensch. And we have many precursors throughout the history in the West and in the East. One of these days we, we may do the kind of inventory of those people. <laughs> but today I focus on uh, Blake. So now what kind of psychology and consciousness will the Ubermensch have? What kind of philosophy and cosmology will the Ubermensch have? That's the question. Modernity with its scientific worldview has brought about an irreconcilable ontological schism or schism and separation. The best term is diremption, the separation between matter and mind or body and soul. That which thinking things and extended things, which was initiated and exemplified the philosophy of Rene Descartes. The Cartesian paradigm defines a fundamental worldview of modernity, including physics, cosmology, psychology, and cognitive science. This Cartesian paradigmatic schism or diremption between matter and mind or the external world and the internal world constitutes a fundamental element of the crisis of consciousness. However, the, the diremption, the separation will be completely resolved in the cosmology and psychology of the Ubermensch. There will be a complete reconsideration and theoretical unification between the cosmology, the external world, and the psychology, the internal world. That is the cosmology of the macrocosm and the psychology of the microcosm will be united 
under the same ontological structural principles. Therefore, spirituality in science or the spiritual worldview and scientific worldview will be united inside a single framework. The universe will be seen at once as the anthropocosmos and the cosmoanthropos. The possibility and the potential that are inherent in human consciousness have been explored and realized by the individuals belonging to esoteric spiritual traditions, most of which are shrouded in mystery. The philosophers and scholars who study those esoteric teachings express them in mesoteric or exoteric languages and formulations. And by the time they reach the masses, if they ever reach them, become diluted or distorted and made into belief systems. So even when people repeat, a God is within, God is within, it is not that they know what it means. So these are the harbingers of the consciousness of the future, as well as the realizer of the possibility of human consciousness. In the West, Bruno, Spinoza, Nietzsche were example of the geniuses who on their own penetrated into the mesoteric realm while Jacob Bohm or William Blake were examples of the geniuses who essentially on their own penetrated into the esoteric realm. Thomas Aquinas or St. Augustine, they are on the level of uh, mesoteric. I don't see anything esoteric in their writings. So there are four or five salient features of the psychology of the Ubermensch Homo Deus. One is this, living at the level of cause, not effect. They see themselves as the cause, not the effect. They be cause. And the cause is within. Actually, they are the cause. So man is all imagination. God is man and exists in us and we in him. The eternal body of man is the imagination. That is God himself. This is William Blake. Man is all imagination. God is mind and exists in us and we in him. The eternal body of man is the imagination. That is God himself. God within, the Christ within, to which the Bible repeatedly refers is to Blake, the imagination that dwells in all of us. To Blake, the stories in the Bible is, is not historical, but psychological. Same story repeated over and over again with different names. Some historical event may have been used as a metaphor. But fundamentally for him, the Bible was the treasury of psychology. So to live from the imagination is to live as the creator. To live from the imagination is to live as the cause. It categorically transcends the state of living as the effect 
at the level of effect in the three-dimensional space-time reality. It is to live in the fourth dimension and create therefrom the three-dimensional effects in the three-dimensional reality. This imagination is what St. Thomas Aquinas termed actus ascendi, translated as act of being, which is God, that is I am, or well, I am that I am, self-revealing within you as the creative causative power. Thomas Aquinas defined uh, or described this acutus, uh, actus ascending, yeah, I think. Act of being a little differently from what I said. This is how Blake understood act of being to be, which is the imagination residing with each one of us. If God is within, then we are the creator of our own world. So in the previous presentation, I mentioned the temporalization of space as a critical new element of the new consciousness that will emerge. The consciousness we have, we specialize time. And I said a new mode will be Temporalizing space. The psychology of the Ubermensch is first and foremost the psychology of the creator, the imaginer. You are the creator of yourself, life, and reality. And therefore, you are 100% responsible for your destiny and for your world. Victim consciousness is the default mode of human consciousness. And psychology today, we see ourselves as being at the effect of external factors. Therefore, the psychology of the Ubermensch is a radical departure, a radical transcendence from the present human psychology. And yet it is possible for us living today when we identify ourselves with our imagination rather than our sensory perceptions, we have discovered the core of reality. So this happened through the breakdown of the bicameral mind. And this possibility and potential have been kept alive by being actualized, realized by few individuals throughout our uh, human history. Many of them are persecuted. Most of them are forgotten. Now we want to resurrect them along with the resurrection of God within us. Now, second element, of the psychology of the Ubermensch correspond to what I said I talked about in terms of the levels of intelligence. And he remarked at the end of his letter to Thomas Butts, who was his uh, sponsor, who purchased many of his uh, plates and great fan of uh, uh, Brake's philosophy. This letter was dated in November 22nd, 1802. He says this, this is a poem. Now I a fourfold vision see, and a fourfold vision is given to me. This fourfold in my supreme delight, and threefold 
in soft bulas night and twofold always. May God us keep from single revision and nature's, uh, sorry, Newton's sweep. He was really against Newton. <laughs> you can tell. <laughs> Newton was beyond single vision, by the way. <laughs> this corresponds with the four levels of human intelligence I spoke about in the first session of the series. Level one in the computational algorithmic intelligence of information processing. Second is rational interactive intelligence of reason and understanding space-time realm. Number three is intuition and imaginational intelligence of knowledge from the future and creation of the future. This goes beyond space-time. And actually, this is the dimension where you are in the in a true sense of the world, you, you be in the time dimension only. You have the view of the past, you have the view of the future, and then you have, you are free from the uh, binding of space. You can revise your past and you become the creator of the future. And number four, spiritual intelligence of knowledge of and from the transfinite realm, which is beyond, beyond time and space. The last two, intuition, imagination, and spiritual intelligence, belong to the supracorporeal realm, where threefold vision and fourfold vision that uh, William Blake talked about manifest. The first two are corporeal. So when you have a single vision, it means sensory perception. Two-fold vision is the dualistic reason and conception based on the single vision. That's where most people stay. Three-fold vision is the integra integral conception. So the reason is there and plus the intuition, the imagination enter entering. So you become free from the bind of the sensory awareness. You can think anew, you can imagine anew, and you receive the information, not from the known, but something beyond the known. But Burek is talking about fourfold vision, is the, all of that plus the spiritual intelligence. The difference between spiritual intelligence and any other form of intelligence is that with the other form of intelligence, you know of an object. There's always you being here and knowing. Spiritual intelligence make, makes us aware of the different way of knowing which is knowing by becoming. So the knower is the known is the knowing. So Brake had fourfold vision opened. And therefore he has definitely pray, uh, post, uh, positioned, uh, variated the imagination infused with the spiritual intelligence higher than reason, which is bound by the sensory uh, perception and space and time. So the psychology or consciousness of the Ubermensch is full spectrum. All four intelligences are working in harmony. But the center of consciousness is situated in the spiritual intelligence 
inspired imagination and in, uh, intuition. So today, uh, people's consciousness are more seated in a, a second level. And occasionally they may have some imagination or in, uh, intuition, but they are situated in second. Uh, fourfold vision, the consciousness of the movement, the person lives and operate from spiritually inspired imagination and the intuition. So maybe that's the only difference between uh, Son of God, the Christ, and God himself. The spiritual intelligence is this dimension of uh, divinity. And, and Christ is an incarnation of that spiritual intelligence in the imagination. Now, the third element that is very important, it's psychology and of Ubermensch, Homo Deus. The psychology is united with cosmology because we will regain the self-awareness of ourselves as a microcosm of the universe in a true sense of the word, hologram, entirety of the universe is each one of us. Today we see ourselves is in this material universe, a speck of doubt, uh, dust, which has some internal uh, dimension and external dimension. No, we are the universe. The psychology corresponds to cosmology. Therefore, we are able to understand the cosmology in all its uh, ontological dimensions, which correspond to the level of consciousness that we have. So, again, this has been in the literature throughout the human history. The cosmology of the macro, macrocosm or universe and the psychology of the microcosm or the human consciousness being united and it universe becomes anthropocosmos and the cosmoanthropos. And this way of seeing the universe, you can find if you look for it. And the contemporary um, spiritual teacher, one of my more, most favorite, George Gurdjieff, has this cosmic law at the basis of his cosmology and philosophy. There are a number of laws, but most uh, fundamental. He calls this Triyamazi Kamno, uh, which is law of threefoldness. And this law of threefoldness you will find in the literature throughout human history. And this law of threefoldness applies both to uh, Anthropos, the human, and cosmos, which means we and cosmos constitutionally have a tripartite structure the ontological structural constitutions of the cosmos and anthropos are both in the structure of trichotomy. So now, 
in Christianity, we have the Holy Trinity of God, Holy God, Ghost, and Son, which correspond to the perennialism, the tradition of the perennial wisdom, spiritus, anima, and corpus, which St. Augustine used in his theological uh, expositions. In Hinduism and Jainism, we have Tribhuvana. Do you say Tribhuvana or Tribhuvana? Tribhuvan. Oh, okay. Thank you. Three worlds. In Buddhism, we have three kaya, three bodies or gestalts of the of Buddha. In Taoism, the two primary canonical texts, Tao Te Ching, which we studied, and Tai Xuan Jing, both employ 81 ternary tetragrams based on the ternary logic consisting of Qian, Di, Ren, or in Japanese, Ten, Qi, Jin, Ten, positive and active force or element, Qi, negative or passive force or element, and Jin, neutral or reconciling force or element. The threeness has been present in the esoteric consciousness of humanity since the beginning. And let's look at this more carefully. And I want to see this as Anthropos and Cosmos. Since I know Buddhism, better than any other <laughs> spiritual traditions. Uh, I will use this uh, tri Trikaya. And Trikaya is a Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, and Nirmanakaya, which can be interpreted as corresponding to Christian Trinity of God, Holy Ghost, and Sons, or Spiritus, Anima, and corpus of perennialism. So Dharmakaya, God and Spiritus, is the realm of being which is beyond time and space, that which is eternal and infinite, the tri transfinite realm of reality, to which we have a access through our spiritual intelligence. And we understand through our spiritual intuition. That dimension exists in the cosmos as well. So the cosmos is infinite and eternal in the sense that goes beyond space and time. Sambhogakaya, the second, Holy Ghost and an Anima is that realm of being which is only time, only of time, only temporal, no space, no spatiality that which is bound only by time, but unbound by space. This is the uh, sempiternal or eviternal. St. Thomas Aquinas used the word eviternal. It is a cross of eter eternity, not exactly eternity. And which means like everlasting. So this is like a spiritual intelligence 
and the uh, Dhammakaya and Sambhogakaya, you know, uh, although we are kind of separating, but it is like uh, where you focus your attention. But both dimensions, it is a super corporeal. It is not bound by space. And that dimension exists in, in the cosmos as well. And Nirmanakaya or sun, corpus, is the realm of being which is of space and time. That which is bound by time and space. This is the corporeal realm of reality. So corporeal realm of reality and corporeal perception, sensory perception and conception. And so far, the physics and science has been limited in this dimension. But this is a part of the universe and part of our intelligence and consciousness. There are higher realm to our consciousness and to the universe. Actually, this is kind of off subject. Maybe I can talk about this uh, when we talk about cosmology. But we, today's science is not even corporeal. It's subcorporeal, subatomic particles are not a corporeal entities. It is subcorporeal. As Heisenberg said, subatomic particles are something like a potential. It is uh, something between existence and um, uh, potentiality. All there is is probability. So, like Aristotelian hieromorphism and Thomas Aquinas's substantial form has tremendous validity. For something to exist, it needs to have materiality and form. Subatomic level, it only has materiality. It can be measured. But when it is measured, it enters into corporeality. Until then, it only has a probability. So it subsists. So ontologically, corporeal uh, dimension is more primary than this uh, subcorporeal realm. But anyway, so going back to the psychology, which correspond to cosmology. The whole thing opens up. Universe, the Ubermensch, the Homo Deus, new kind of humans, and all the initiative esoteric schools throughout the ages, they experience themselves and the universe in a much more alive and expansive way. And because psychology and cosmology correspond, your life has meaning and cosmos has meaning. We live in a very meaningful universe. In the beginning, where's the meaning? The meaning was with God. The meaning was God. It does not deny some of the discoveries that uh, science has made in the last 200 years. But it will be partial. It is a part of the whole scheme of cosmos. 
which is reflected in our human consciousness, full spectrum consciousness and full spectrum universe. And it is quite remarkable. Just people need to see the grandeur of their own being. So that's most essential and in our presentation, third component of the psychology of movement. Fourth dimension, a uh, fourth uh, element is that uh, there is no such thing as unconsciousness, but only consciousness. In the uh, full spectrum consciousness of the Ubermensch, there will be no split between the conscious and unconscious. Modern psychology was begun and developed in the 19th and early 20th centuries by such brilliant minds as Wilhelm Wundt, Gustav Le Bon, William James, Pierre Janet, Sigmund Freud, Boris Sidis, Alfred Adler, Carl Jung, and so on and so forth. Most of their psychological theories and psychological theories developed by their followers were developed within the Cartesian paradigm. Therefore, physics and psychology are literally a world apart. The sort of looking at the possible connection, structural ontological connection between the macrocosm and the microcosm never even occurs. Maybe Jung has some inkling. Further, such influential theories as those of Freud, Adler, and Jung were developed mostly by medical doctors, psychiatrists, primarily inside the therapeutic setup through the study of so-called mental or psychological illnesses. They study the psychology of those who suffer from psychological illnesses. And therefore, those who are severely split and divided within. In one sense, when you focus on some aspect of psychology, it helps to study some extreme cases. But to study <laughs> the psychology of the Ubermensch, we need to study psychologically healthy, spiritually awakened human beings. The contemporary uh, precursors of Ubermensch, you can study directly. And those who are the precursors of the Ubermensch from the past through you know, reading the text, textually, their biography and so on and so forth, but mostly what they have written. So the very one salient aspect of the psychology of the Ubermensch is that he or she is not divided internally. No fragmentation of consciousness, which means he or she is internally whole and complete and that he or she has no region 
of the unconscious, which means he or she is self-transparent. There is an integral differentiation in the consciousness of the Ubermensch into the conscious and subconscious, the young and in aspect of consciousness. So the consciousness through the spiritually inspired uh, imagination imagines and create ideas, then impregnate the subconscious with that idea. It, it is like a sperm, semination. And then the subconscious as the matrix, the womb of creation, give birth to and manifest the idea in actuality. So you imagine new future. And using your imagination, you live in that imagination and feel it. And then that whole experience become impregnated into the another dimension of your consciousness, which we call subconscious. It is like a womb, a matrix. And then it finds a way <laughs> to manifest. Today's new age law of attraction is uh, diluted uh, and partialized version of this process. It is an uh, esoteric knowledge. Some people got um, burned at the stake by teaching this in the past. Michael Servatus, 1553. Swedenborg also came up with the same kind of ideas. William Brake, obviously. Some of the New Thought teachers understood this. Then, comes a new age law of attraction teachers who don't really understand this process. I'm not saying everybody, I'm sure there's some. And they used to advance their careers. They served them, but people didn't really get this. This is an aspect of new mode of consciousness. So I'm not denying a subconsciousness. But unconscious in the sense that you are not aware. You are aware. Uh, by the way, this new consciousness sees itself, consciousness, as the only reality. And therefore, it is capable of actually by being in the dimension of time only can devise the past. What happened in the space-time uh, dimension as a fact, as an effect, it stays in that dimension. But you can revise what happened in your mind in two ways. One is change your interpretation of the past. It's 
Second, by creating a new story in your mind. So you truly become a creator and then you become the really a creator of your own life and reality. And the last dimension, uh, not the last, but the last salient uh, aspect of this um, consciousness, uh, psychology of Ubermensch is uh, quite obvious actually. The Ubermensch is an authentic free thinker. <laughs> it is freed from sensory perception. It is freed from space time. So therefore it is freed from all the belief systems that arises there. So there are, the term belief is used in three ways. One is externally originating and uncritically accepted sub-rational beliefs with doubts and questions suppressed and repressed. That's a belief system of religions Actually, it goes beyond religion. Communism, socialism, capitalism, any isms. <laughs> they become beliefs. It's an external authority mentality, that belief. Ubermensch is free from that completely. And we can be free from that also. Much of my teaching has been in this domain because unless this happens, people cannot go any further. The second way the belief is used, somebody like uh, uh, Charles Sanders Pierce, Pierce, internally understood rational, stable belief established as the result of thinking, rethinking, examination, re-examination, and experimentation and re-experimentation with all doubts and questions satisfactorily answered. So it's more like a theory. And they use that word as belief. It's a more like a knowledge. And the third belief, way the belief is used. This is how the Ubermensch would use. Intuitively understood or understood and imaginatively created transrational belief that is the guiding image of the future to be manifested in the right time. It is a vision and having faith in that vision. So the third belief, a second and third belief, if we use the belief in this way, Uber meant you have. But the first belief, he is completely free. So the Uber Mensch is free of the belief and the believing mentality of the first kind acquires the second kind of belief, stable belief, which is sound knowledge and understanding the world and reality, and lives as the faithful creator of his or her own character, future, destiny, world, and reality. The Ubermensch is the original, authentic, independent, free thinker. And for the Ubermensch to think is to imagine and to create. And in that creation imagination, individuality, individual sing singularity come into play.
Now, cosmology is very involved and I will have to speak about quantum physics and uh, relativity theory. And we have already spent one hour. So maybe we can do the second part of this the next time we meet. Sounds and good. I will focus on cosmology. It is, it is very important. Any change in human consciousness and any change in the world, new cosmology is needed. And uh, any teacher who is powerful enough to really impact people, they have their own cosmology. So Bhagavad Gita has cosmology. Savitri is a cosmology, mythologically expressed. Gurdjieff's Beelzebub's tale is the most unique cosmology ever propounded. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so we will go into this cosmology of the Ubermensch or Homo Deus next time. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Yes, Yasuhiko, this is so incredible. Like I just, I cannot fully express how, how deep this is. This is just incredible. And um, so what I want to do is I want to give a chance for people to um, ask questions. Folks, keep your questions short. Um, we're going to collect all the questions. We're going to organize them and then we'll take a few of them and Yasuhiko will talk about them in detail. So um, go ahead and type an exclamation mark if you would like to, um, to ask. But I have to say one thing, uh, Yasuhiko. Um, I really loved your way of converting the start of the Gospel of John. That in the beginning was the meaning and the meaning was with God and the meaning was God. <laughs> All things were made through the meaning. Yes. Without it, nothing was made that was made. Mm -hmm. And the meaning, in meaning was life. Yes. And the life was the light of men. Yes. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Yes. Just, just beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Uh, folks, uh, go ahead and type an exclamation mark if you would like to put your question on the table. Let's not do uh, lengthy uh, comments. Just if you want, you can do a short comment and then you can go ahead and ask a question. Uh, we'll start with James. James, go ahead. What's your question? Yeah, I just want to ask, um, this is a really great uh... Uh, discussion um, talk and uh, I want to ask if Hegel, you know, would fall into this kind of, uh, um, you know, ontology, sure, and cosmology, and because he has a more of a rationalistic uh, rather, rather than an imaginative. Sure. Kind of so I'll, I'll put that as a question uh, as, you know, where does Hegel fit, fit in this? Next Great, up thanks. is uh, Rupali followed by Brian. Rupali. Yes, so um, this was just amazing uh, conversation. Thank you. Um, I uh, have a question about the, uh, how do we tap our imagination to create the future? Uh, what, what practices do we need to inculcate within ourselves uh, in our daily routines to be able to tap into that imaginary uh, faculty? It reminds me of uh, so many people, you know, Louis Sullivan, Vivekanand, all of them have talked about imagination being the supreme uh, power that humans have. Uh, Maria Montessori talks about it. And uh, how, how can we make that into our practice? The second question I have is that if we, um, if we, uh, aren't able to tap into our imagination, then how do we transform the world? Uh, I've read so many places that you first transform 
yourself and then you can transform the world. But uh, my question is, you know, do people who have achieved this level of consciousness, do they then keep it to themselves or do they, uh, do they make it a part of um, a larger, larger scope? For example, in Jainism, the Tirthankaras wrote the books that when they uh, attained that level of <coughs> spirituality. In Buddhism, we have practices, uh, so on and so forth. And then I just have to say, William Blake is one of my favorite poets, The Tiger and the Lamb. Uh, our students love it. They know those poems by heart at our school. Uh, and, you know, the whole idea of duality in the poem of uh, Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright. And um, about the lamb who is it the same god that created the same hand that created the lamb and the tiger um it and you know bhagavad gita addresses that duality in so many of its verses so your your talk today just kind of brought so many pieces together in my own mind thank you wonderful thank you thank you rupali fantastic questions fantastic questions uh next up is going to be uh brian olga and Ever. Brian. So okay, I'm on my iPad for me. Yes, go ahead. Okay. The um, this uh, at the end you talked about acquiring stable belief uh, or as part of the path to Ubermensch. At least that's how I understood it. Could you explain more about the acquiring stable belief? How is that different from isms? Uh, or maybe touching on Charles Sanders Pierce as a, a way of explaining this. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, next up is Olga. Olga, what's your question? Hey, hi. Thank you for your talk. Um, uh, it's still uh, something like unclear why there is separation of inside and outside exist and uh, what's the reason for creating this separation and um, if this um, um, removing this separation of external internal and God is a external and there is something human internal if we remove it could it be a basis for absolute self-justification and justification of everything that human doing, including the absolutely bad and evil things, but it's good. Why, why we should judge it if okay. there is no separation? Thank That's you. the what question. You, thank you. Thank you. Uh, what's the basis of the internal and external separation? Excellent. Um, Folks, uh, these are great questions. Keep the questions coming. We will collect all of them, and then we will, we're going to select a few of them and go into them in great amount of detail. Uh, next up is Ever, followed by Ryan. Ever. Um, hi, sir. Can, it was a great talk today. Um, I just want to clarify two points. Um, number one, in terms of the moral dimensions of the Ubermensch before he's an Ubermensch, does he have to transform to some sort of ethical or ethical basis of existence? Um, maybe, I don't know what school, but there must be some. I just wanted to understand that in greater detail. And finally, the idea of reality. Once this transformation has taken place, what type of reality does this person inhabit? What's it like? Can, is there any signifiers to ratify that they exist in that reality? Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. I have a great, great question. How does transformation for a person into Ubermensch happen? And what's their reality like? Excellent. We'll definitely uh, look at that. Uh, next up is going to be Ryan, followed by James. Ryan. Hi, good morning. Thanks for uh, speaking today. I had a question regarding the idea that this is limited to man, um, consciousness, I believe can expand to animals and perhaps they have imagination as well. Uh, do you think this also applies to animals and we're just more up on the evolved um, scale? Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, next up is going to be uh, James and then we're going to 
uh, talk about these questions. James, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I just have another question about um, uh, desire. Uh, in, uh, you know, uh, Buddhism, desire is uh, supposed to be uh, suppressed or uh, to be eliminated. But in William Blake, uh, he seems to celebrate desire. And that's the same thing with the Upanishad, right? Uh, the celebration of desire. So I, mean, I really would like an answer to this, uh, this kind of um, one Wonderful. of differences. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, James. Uh, fantastic questions, folks. Uh, so, um, yes, yeah, Suhiko, uh, I have some ideas about how to proceed. Uh, there are two or three general questions mm -hmm. about that. Uh, the question that Rupali asked, how do you tap into your imagination? Uh, and then if you've, when you've transformed yourself, how do you transform the world? What is the relationship between you transforming yourself then we had a question on how does Uberman come to be? Uh, how, how does a person transform into Uberman? And then what is their reality like? I was thinking that these questions seem to be the most general ones. Uh, do you think that that's a good place to start? Uh, I missed a few of the questions. Sure. So uh, what I would, sure. Uh, uh, so uh, I came in when uh, Rupari was talking. Sure. So uh, what are the other questions they uh, people sure. asked? Uh, okay, so let, let me um, list the gen general questions first and then specific questions. Mm -hmm. So the general questions first is how do you, what do you do to tap into our imaginative faculty? What kind of daily routines do you need to do to make this a stand, you know, mm -hmm. core part, every moment part, every day part of our lives? That was Rupali's question. The second part of her question was that she noticed that many of the greats are pe people, when they have transformed themselves, they also end up transforming the world. Mm -hmm. So what is the relationship between transforming oneself and transforming the world? And how do you go about doing that? Mm -hmm. uh, the next general question was uh, that of how does one transform oneself into a Ubermatch? What is the process? And what is the reality of such a person? Next is why is there a internal and external separation? Um, next is what is the nature of desire? Uh, how does desire work in a Ubermatch? Um, then there were two specific questions um, does this apply to animals and does this apply to Hegel or how does this apply to Hegel? So those were the two uh, specific questions. So the, uh, and then one last question was about one of the three phases uh, about acquiring stable belief. Uh, what is the nature of that? So these were all the questions. Okay, maybe we can kind of put them all together. Sure. And then I just talk. Please, please, <laughs> go ahead. You're informed by the questions. Uh, just uh, briefly, um, uh, the gentleman asked about uh, Buddhism and uh, breaks different, uh, seemingly different interpretation of desire. And uh, this is one of those uh, places, you know. Uh, so I, I am an initiate in the esoteric tradition of Buddhism, which is mostly oral. oral tradition. Uh, so I studied under a master. <clears throat> then I start to see the same applies to <laughs> most religions anyway. Um, the, this denial of desire is an exoteric misinterpretation of a Buddhist notion of desire. You see, if somebody wants to get enlightened, that is a desire too. And what esoteric Buddhism teaches is the refinement of desire in the process of uh, spiritual uh, discipline. And so there's a basic desire. When you enter, when you be conscious, the more you become conscious, 
of yourself and movement of desire by the very uh, act of being conscious desire start to become more and more defined and so it is not a denial of desire it is being stuck in the base desire and not evolving as human beings so it is a desire being uh, ongoing defined into a finer and finer a desire desire is life and if you de uh, deny desire you de uh, you deny life but if you stay in this base desire unconsciously there is no uh, uh, first of all you will not gain uh, happiness <laughs> and cause other problems and also you are denying the evolution and development of consciousness that is the, in a way, essential purpose of a human life. So that's it. And then in terms of belief, uh, Charles uh, Sanders Peirce used the word belief almost in the sense of a hypothesis or theory. And sometimes scientists and you know, uh, interactor use this term belief in the way that uh, he defined it. So it is, uh, uh, the Ubermensch will also have a hypothesis and theories. When you're, you get into the um, intellectual conversation and uh, intellectual understanding of the universe, you may develop some theories and uh, you test it, test it, test it, examine it, examine it. They eventually come to the point that it might, maybe this is more like truth. So, so long as we, we are being in a consciousness and the universe contains a three-dimensional uh, dimension, three dimensional realm, there are always uncertainties. And there, are, there will be no 100% absolute uh, truth in that, in that dimension. But you know, so some, when Newton came up with his theory, Nothing, nobody asked any question. Wow, this is it. But now there are some holes. Now the Einstein relativity, it is not meeting the standard anymore. So, you know, the, when we progress in our knowledge, we begin to have, you know, a question. But when at this particular time in history, when every question and every uh, doubt is cleared by one theory, and this is a stable belief, but it's still te uh, uh, tentative in the larger sch scheme of things. And that's what uh, uh, Sanders was talking about. Now, in and out, <laughs> and the, so the universe, the cosmos, has three realms beyond time and space, time only, and space time. And in the space time dimension, only direction that movement has is in and out. There are no such thing as up and down. But there or left and right, as Bakumi Safura said, but there's only in, in, in and out movement. So when we have in and out, uh, so internal and external, we look at uh, stati uh, stati uh, statically, but actually when you look at the phenomenon of this, what we call in is a attuning our awareness to the inward movement. And when I say out, it is attuning the movement into the uh, outer world. So that is a kind of a two-way motion of the universe, basic motion in and out. And then you will see this is in and out. Now, uh, that only exists in the space-time realm. There is no in and out in the time only or space, uh, the uh, transfinite dimensions. And another thing is uh, 
you know, people use the term the uh, system. What is system? Universe isn't the system. Consciousness is not the system. System is that which divides the universe uh, between uh, inside and outside in the space-time dimensions. So when you uh, set up a system, the system divide the universe into inside and outside and the periphery. When you read the Bakumin Safura's synergetics, he make it even more complex than the three, but the, this basic three, when you bring in time, there's a more divisions. But anyway, so when you, you set up a system, you have an inside the system, outside the system and the periphery of the system. So the movement of in and out, number one, and we have a way of thinking in which we will create a system to really study something. In which case, there's always an inside and out, but it is a human construct. System is a human construct. There are a way of looking at the universe without having this, uh, this construct, but uh, it is extremely useful to do this. Uh, and ge geogra uh, geometry is based on this. So uh, I, I like the way system scientists use the term system. And so, uh, so, so long as we do this, we will have a in and out. Um, let's see, transformation of the, of the world. The way to transform the world. We talked about this before in our series. First, self-transformation. When you go to a psycho, psych, psycho, psychologist, you spend hours and hours and years and years analyzing yourself. And you remember the past and what happened and the trauma and all those uh, ther therapeutic way of conversation and looking at ourselves. To me, it is um, counterproductive. <clears throat> So trans the Asian people, they had a trauma in life and they didn't go to a psych psychologist. They somehow transformed themselves and freed themselves from those traumas. How they did that? So when you observe yourself, all the, what constitute your consciousness in a continuous, uh, mentation, conversation, inner conversation. When you change, you have different kind and set of uh, internal conversations. Who you are is basically defined by the kind of uh, internal conversation you have. So to change yourself and transform yourself you just need to uh, willfully change the internal conversation you have. It is not lying. It is a use, by the use of uh, imagination, you, you begin to create new set of internal conversations. And when this happens, things change. So one element, I mean, uh, one element of uh, transformation is a transformation of internal conversations. When you do meditate, you begin to hear this, that you become more acutely aware of the internal conversation you are having in the space of silence. Then you can see based on what you want uh, for yourself, you can imagine different state of uh, being and consciousness in which different kind of conversations are taking place. And then you begin to have that conversation. And after a week, a month of having a new kind of conversations about yourself, about your life, especially about yourself, you are no longer the same person. Also, past, you have a, whatever happened, 
you have a set of in interpretations. And usually based on this Cartesian paradigm, you blame others for whatever it is happening because the cause is in their parents, your education system, your society. So, you know, you don't see a cause within yourself, cause outside. This is a, you know, the one way of looking at the, the Cartesian separation, seeing external to be a cause. Now, whatever happened, happened. You can actually change the interpretation. Well, I was born into an uneducated family. There was no books. And I was too smart for the school. I was utterly bored and completely, um, and there was no intellectual stimulation. So until the age of 15 or 16, I said, you know, I, I didn't like my parents. And I didn't like their expectations. And I, you know, it's like a, then I changed the interpretation completely. Wow. This gave me an opportunity to think for myself, first of all. And all those sufferings that I had experienced in a short period of time in my life is a source of um, understanding of life. So thank my parents, my teachers. They are God uh, expressing themselves, creating a situation in which I have to suffer, which suffering made me who I am. I gained wisdom. So changing the interpretations. And sometimes, you know, uh, when you, before you go to bed, you, you review your life and say, hmm. Oh. And then change your, change your, in your mind, what happened to a more ideal scenario. Not that you're changing the fact, but the changing, so you're feeling your emotion uh, changes. And then you go to bed, next morning, you have a different state of mood, a mood. And the kind of things you don't want to have in your life begin to disappear. So in the most practical sense, we can use our imagination this way. Now in, a, in terms of transformation, so center of your consciousness move from sensory to uh, intellectual reason to imagination, intuition, and the spiritual. This is a transformation. Once we get there, we have an internal conversation about ourselves, also conversation about the world. You have a different, different world. The first people who are transformed has live in a different world. When you look at uh, two people who are totally you know, uh, lost, and the person who's enlightened. So in your world, they live in the same world. No, when you go into their world, it's the entire different world. So to, you begin to live in heaven. That's what uh, you know, uh, breaks marriage of heaven and hell. And what, something happens there and break lives there. And then people, <laughs> <laughs> begin to be impacted not only by reading his poems which very few people read when he was alive <laughs> what the Nietzsche's um, Zarathustra only 40 copies were sold when, while he was alive or he, while he was still uh, sane but now Millions of people have read. So you, you begin to express, you, you, be, you, you be there, you live a different kind of world. And using your imagination, creative imagination, your own poetic genius to express yourself. And uh, as a result, people be impacted. But at the same time, the real understanding that uh, William Blake is conveying 
cannot be easily understand, understood because the level of consciousness is so different. Uh, Gurudev's uh, law of three has many different uh, applications and the expressions. One is this, higher me the lower and create the middle. So uh, we, we read the uh, break, we read uh, uh, Aurobindo, we read uh, Gurudev, and then we are here, we read them, and then in the process, somehow we get here. And then try again. So you read something else higher, and then eventually you read the reach where it was, something like that. So, you know, uh, if you're committed to your transformation, that's what we do, yes? So that is the transformation. You live different kind of world and express yourself in a way that is appropriate to you. And as a result, it has an impact. And uh, if you have reached very high level of understanding, you realize very few people actually understand you. Voice in a you know, long world, that's okay. And uh, if you are speaking here, some people, uh, come and that is amazing if somebody listens to you and somehow develops you know and uh, so that's uh, that's uh, the my uh, response what else what else was that? um the next question i would like to put put forth is the question of what kind of daily practices you know how do you how do you do this on a daily basis how do you incorporate it into daily basis Ah, okay. Before I do that, one, one other question I, rem I remember. Uh, so, the ancient teachings and the authentic teachings, they emphasize the importance of ethics. Morality, that, that, that a gentleman asked about morality. And this corresponds to this particular question. And uh, in the late 20th century and, and 21st century, uh, psychology and psychotherapy kind of eliminated the concern for ethics. And when you go into uh, spirituality, you know, ethics is not really a, that important subject. It's actually more like a psychology. You know, you, you want to uh, thera therapeutize yourself and then somehow, you know, you have to free yourself. From, you have to... Uh, do the work on your shadows of your own creation. <laughs> and you have to work on your un, uh, you know, unconscious and you have to clean up your traumas and, blah, 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 blah. and, and then, then you can get a spiritual enlightenment, it become extremely therapeutic spirituality. And then ethics disappeared. Now, when consciousness for consciousness to integrally evolve. It is important to evolve not only your intellectual and mental intelligence of which uh, I spoke, but also emotional intelligence, intelligence, affective emotional intelligence, and uh, uh, physical kinetic intelligence that need to be a harmonious development of those three. That's why uh, Gurujev talks about uh, humans as a three brain beings, three brains, mental, emotional, and physical. And all those uh, brains need to be developed harmoniously. And when all those three develop harmoniously, consciousness develops. And when de consciousness develops, when you look at the emotional dimension, intelligence, that is called conscience. Conscience is an aspect of uh, the evolved uh, consciousness seen from or experienced from the emotional intelligence. And purpose of ethics in the spiritual transformation is the development of conscience. If somebody has a real conscience as a part of the developed consciousness, 
he or she does not need a moral code. He or she will do the right thing, moral and ethical thing, spontaneously. He does not need a Ten Commandment. He will do things that are appropriate, ethically and morally. So um, it is extremely important for us to pay attention to the development of an ethical mind, ethical heart, which is conscience. And to do that, we need to integrate the uh, development of our emotional intelligence along with the physical kinetic intelligence with the mind that is developing. So mental consciousness, emotional conscience, and sensitive and kinetically defined body are essential. This is an integral yoga, I would say. So that's, that's why the morality is very important. Now, um, going back to, so what's the practice of doing this? Um, <clears throat> so we want to really begin to use our uh, intuition and imagination, which is the intermediary between intellectual and spiritual. Originally, it may be more intellectual and uh, intuitive imagination, but eventually, you know, it becomes spiritual uh, and uh, imagination and, uh, and uh, intuition. So what do we do? Oh, first of all, you need to really um, pay attention to your body and uh, kinetic intelligence. Uh, you want to develop a lifestyle, that lifestyle in which your body is properly nurtured and whose intelligence is properly heard. Do some basic exercise to keep the body in a good condition. Emotion. We use our imagination to develop the emotional intelligence. So when, when you are having an, all kinds of negative emotions and we are reacting to life, we, are, we have been conditioned to react emotionally. And the development of emotional intelligence is from reactivity to respond, responsive, responsiveness. And uh, higher emotional inter, intelligence means you respond emotionally without reacting. So reaction is immediate. Emotional uh, response is all has a holistic intelligence involved in this. And then you, uh, react, uh, respond. Now, how do you do that? So you can use this at the moment of your uh, um, meditation. So you check the, your emo emotional state and then you see what it is that your emotion or emotions are reacting. It is a, some state of uh, life, a condition of life. Then using your imagination, you create different condition in your imagination. And then experience it in your imagination. With this, your emotional reaction becomes 
will change into a something else. So negative emotion, anger can become compassion. So by the use of imagination, you idealize the condition and experience the heightened emotion. This is a practice and uh, you can do. And when you become good at this, in any situations, you be, uh, start to uh, you start to not react, but switches into uh, emotional uh, response and begin to have a different kind of emotion, which means you begin to be uh, not um, influenced by the happenings in the world. So it is a change in the interpretation and a change in the condition in your uh, emotion, uh, in your, so you basically change the state of consciousness which you reflect in your state of emotion. And this is uh, after a week, a month of practicing this, you will notice a huge difference because you are no longer reacting. You are through your imagination and the change in the state of consciousness, you begin to uh, respond. And uh, you see nothing that is happening in this world deserve to negatively impact you. You are God, don't bother me. I am going to be in a good mood no matter what happens. And Actually, when you look at the, uh, uh, the emotion deeply, the ecstasy is the most fundamental emotion of bliss. Ananda is not only there, when, <laughs> only you hear, when you really go deeper, deeper into the emotion, the fundamental emotion that uh, we, you can experience is uh, Ananda. And then we forget about it and we do this. And then when, again, but having gone through this transformational process, now you are no longer disturbed by it. It does not mean you stop completely reaction. Of course it happens, but you know, uh, somehow you are no longer, uh, uh, there will be no chain reactions. There may be initial reaction, absolutely, but there will be no chain reaction. Somehow this reaction stops and then you go back to your, you know, um, good emotions, uh, positive emotions, so to speak. And there you have, uh, you have achieved a higher emotional intelligence because now you have a control and mastery over your emotions. Emotion runs people. You are no longer be run by emotion. The way you are in that state of a higher emotional intelligence, you will also have a conscience. Now, one example of a practice is actually Buddhist Eightfold Path. And uh, you don't need to be a Buddhist to do it, actually. You can actually modify it to your own. Uh, the first one is holistic vision. So what is it? Well, you have a vision of future, your future, that what you want to be, who you want to be, and what kind of world you want to live, and what kind of things that you will be doing. Like you, you have a holistic vision of your world, yourself, and your, your life. Then, next one is uh, integral thinking which is more like an imag imagining that to be the become, having, having become reality. Then you begin to shoken shoshi, shogo, shogun. So then you begin to uh, uh, speak from it, 
meaningful speech. And then, what was that? I forgot the eightfold path. <laughs> Do you not remember? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know it uh, offhand. Shoken Shoshi. Shoma Shomyo, Shonen Shoshi. Wow, God. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you begin to, uh, <laughs> um, when you transcend, you forget everything. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's like you, you walked it so for, much that wow, it's so bad. For being a Buddhist priest, forgetting the eightfold path is like unbelievable. What happened to me? Anyway. <laughs> it's progress, progress, yes. You, uh, it's yeah, all one to you. That's my interpretation at this moment. Yes. Anyway, so, and then, so you have a, uh, you have a, you, you imagine this uh, ideal state, and you 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 begin to uh, live in that uh, in that world, and you start to feel it within yourself, and live your life in accordance with that world that you have created in your imagination. And uh, that is one of the practices you can do. So you, you have a, you pay attention to your physical, you, you pay attention to the, um, your emotion, and you use the imagination to continuously create your life in the way that you want to live. Thank you. Um, what I want to do is that I just wanted to highlight mm -hmm. the difference between the modern thought and what you've been saying mm -hmm. and i want to do it using all the four points that you discussed mm -hmm. you know being at cause versus yes. effect most yes. modern people regard their life as being shaped outside in yes this is being shaped inside out yes exactly, exactly. secondly that is beautifully said wonderful uh secondly modern people think about whenever they think about thinking mm -hmm or levels of intelligence, they are looking at information processing, at best kind of rationally organizing it. Mm -hmm. Whereas this approach comes from two levels up. Yes. Starts with spiritual intelligence, which is informing the intuition. And it includes the other two, uh, other two parts, but driven from this fourth lev level which is a completely integrative way of dealing with every bit of knowledge as opposed to disintegrated mm -hmm. way of just reacting to yes. individual separate things. Uh, that, so that's the second one. The third one is the integration of psychology and cosmology. Yes. Because the modern world, you know, thanks to Descartes and everybody that, uh, taken that in, they look at it as two separate things. This is an integrated way. It is mm. focusing on, you know, Louis Sullivan puts it very beautifully, life began to break in upon him, a continuous breaking in from the outside and breaking out from the inside was to shape his destiny driven by the inside, driven mm. by the soul inside. So that, um, and the last one was your observation about how modern psychology has developed mm. in the context of things going wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're looking at only people who are disintegrated mm -hmm. with all kinds of disintegrations. So this is, um, it's a profoundly different, it's an integrated being driven from the center, fully married to the world. So it is, it removes these dichotomies of matter, matter and spirit and makes it one. So it's a profoundly different view than what people have. So the transition between now, between what people are, most people are, and this, there, there is a significant amount uh, to go. Um, so I, that's the distance that I wanted to just highlight. Yes. Now I ju just check the eightfold path. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because I, recently I changed the interpretation of it. As a result, I forgot about 
original and also new interpretation. <laughs> so the, the first is the holistic vision, as I said, and in, in, the, in the context of a conversation, uh, you can have an integrated a holistic vision of your uh, new life, new self, and new world. The next one is the integral thinking, or you can say the imagination, integral imagination, where you really imagine that world to be present now. Then third is the meaning for speech. So you begin to speak from that world. Living in that world, you, you speak from there. And then right action, which is also you act in accordance with that world. And then number five, my translation says holistic living. The holistic living is that you pay attention to every aspect of our, you know, our life, body, emotion, and mind, and you nurture all of this. And, and also you need to have a uh, lifestyle which is conducive to the evolution of your consciousness and a living accordance with the vision that you have. Then integral discipline, you, you need to have the self-discipline to stick with this one. You know, you need, every day you do this. Holistic vision, integral thinking, meaningful speech, right action, and holistic living. And this means that you remind yourself, you remember yourself, and continue to uh, live that life. And there's a super structure to this. Uh, complete mindfulness and complete integrity. And which means you do all those things and then you, you remain mindful and you be aware, stay conscious. And then integrity, complete integrity, samadhi means, you know, you, you are in the state of uh, being that is beyond time space where your consciousness reside in that space so that all the remaining seven uh, path is present in space-time reality. And uh, so eightfold path was originally designed for some people many, many centuries ago, but the, 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 what is good about this, it, ha it has a integrity and it has a completeness. You need to have a complete integral yoga in uh, Sri Aurobindo's uh, terminology. And it needs to be singularly, cosmically, evolutionary designed for you. You need to find a way, but you need to have, know the element that needs to be present. So that is my uh, answer. It is an extremely important question. And uh, thank you for- Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Yasuhiko. This was- this was incredible. I'm going to have to listen to it immediately afterwards <laughs> in order to get more and more out of it. But uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And look forward uh, to thank next you. time. And thank, thank you, you everybody much. for uh, your questions. Uh, great questions. Uh, have a nice evening, everybody. Bye. <laughs>